Amen. Today, I want to share a little bit about to hear, to speak, to live. Go ahead and pull up the first verse here, or you can pull up on your own, in your Bible, if you will. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, it's in the message translation. God, who got you started on this spiritual adventure, you know, God does that. We, some of us may take credit for our choice to serve Jesus, or I went to church, but the Bible says that God grants us repentance. Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father Nobody comes to me except the Father who sent me draws them. So God's the one. God who started, got you started on this spiritual adventure, shares with us the life of His Son. I don't know about you guys, but I love it when these little kernels of Scripture jump out. That, that God took some of the life from His Son, this Zoe life, this this miraculous, eternal life of God. He took it, took some of Jesus' life and he shared it with who? Is that like not important to anybody else? The life of God is in you. He shares with us the life of His Son and our Master Jesus. He will never give up on you. You're His son and His daughter. You guys who are parents, will you ever give up on your kids? No matter where they go, what they do, make you proud, make you ashamed. You never give up. God never gives up on you. Never forget that. This is my new favorite scripture. I love this one. He never gives up on you. Never forget that. This coming Friday, we start camp. Come on. Yeah? In these last, well, several weeks, but the last five to ten years, people will walk in this place. Like two weeks ago, we had Pastor Shirley, Shirley uh, Sheila bowling here, and we had church, right? And she was just blown away by your worship, blown away, blown away by the fellowship and the passion people have for the Lord. We said, well, we, we're just here having church. People have been saying that to Celine and I now, for five years, ten years, as they come and they visit. How did, how did this happen? How did Word of Life come up? How did you get this here in Ewok Village? There are several factors. Number one is the Lord. He's the one who decided He wanted a branch of the body of Christ here in Ewok Village. Another major category is the Word of God. The message of life and, and the passion, the courage the courage of Pastor Tom Shaw to teach it and, and to teach us to preach that message of life. Worship, a people passionate for God's presence and, and passionate about it, knowing that worship is what draws him into us to him, him to us. I don't know which way it's going, but we get together in worship. But a major component, a major factor of what has built this place and keeps it here today 49 plus years after it started is a thing called camp. We've been having camp since 1970. I think we've had one or two years where we didn't have camp. I hope as long as Word of Life exists, there will always be something like camp where we focus our energies on the next generation to pour into them the truths the DNA, the core values that the Bible has taught and we have been taught in this place. Camp is one of the main reasons this place is here today. I'm proud of the fact that this year at camp, I'm not in charge of nothing. <laughs> Celine and I are going to watch the granddaughters. I don't have to preach. I don't have to teach. It has been passed to the next generation and they have the passion because we poured it into them. And now they're pouring it in to the next generation. I pray that camp will always be in the future of this church. His word taught, the message of life, his presence 
fellowship, ultimately the fulfillment of his purposes, taught, ingrained, and poured in to the hearts and souls of our kids. They need to know Christianity cannot be a family affair in the sense that you did it because your mama did it, because your mama did it, because her mama did it. Christianity has got to be about relationship between you and your father. And we've got to teach our kids this so that no matter what happens to us, they have a relationship with their father because the purposes of God are going to come to pass and we want to see our kids in the middle of it. I'm not leaving it to them. I'm going to be in the middle of it too. But we have the opportunity. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for a people who can believe and walk in that life that was shared with us. The life so that we can be free to walk in His ways. That is what this church was built on. That's what we're going to pour into our kids. As long as where life is around, it has been, is, and shall be the opportunity to pour those core values in. So in advance of camp, to all the leaders who have been already working their butts off in these last weeks and months, and all those who are going to spend all those hours at camp, we want to say thank you. Turn with me or look at to the overhead at Matthew 10, verse 27 in the New King James. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach. Preach, speak, declare from the housetops. Hear, speak live. 1 Peter 2, verse 24 in the Message Bible. He used his servant body. Who, who's he? Who's he talking about there? He. Let me skip it, move it forward. One more verse. Hello on the sound? Hello up there in the PowerPoint? No? Okay, you're going to hear me say it then. 1 Peter 2, 24. He used his servant body. Who's he? Jesus. He used his servant body to carry our sins to the cross so that we could live with them. That's what most Christianity believes. We certainly can't be free of sin. That's what most of Christianity teaches. But my Bible says that Peter fully embraced the idea that Jesus took our sins to the cross so that we could be rid of them. That we could be rid of sin and free to live in the right way. Oh man, I can't do that. I, I've never been able to do that. My, my mom never did it. My dad never did it. His dad never did it. I don't know. It's, it's in the McDonald family. It's just who I am. Peter said he took it to the cross so we could be rid of it, so we could live free, free to live the right way. I think that's what John was touching on today. Not to listen to the voice of the flesh, but to hear, believe, listen to, and speak, and live what the Word of God says. To be rid of sin. Hear, speak, live. Christianity, as you've heard, well, as long as I've been at this church, I wish to tell you it was an original thought by yours truly. It's not. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's not an audience-based activity. It's, it's a full participation event. In fact, it's actually not even an event or an activity. It's a lifestyle. That's what Christianity was designed to be from the beginning. Christianity is not about just getting together, coming and hearing what somebody has to say. Christianity is not about coming and watching and listening to somebody sing worship songs. 
I'm glad you guys came. If you're a visitor today, I'm glad you came to check us out, to hear, to listen. But if you like what you heard and you plan to stay, plan to get involved. Because at this place, we believe that that's what Christianity is supposed to be. A full involvement, full participation, lifestyle. Because God has called us to hear, to speak, to live it. Revelations 2 Verse 7 says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. How many here have an ear today? How many here have at least one ear today? One working ear. How about an ear with a working uh, ear device in it? Uh, you know, so, no, right? Okay. How many, even if you can't hear, you can see and read? He who has an ear Let them hear what the Spirit is saying. That's a challenge. It's not a recommendation. We just read Matthew 10, 27. Let me read it in the NIV. It says, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. We're being challenged to hear and to speak. To hear and to speak. 1 Peter 2, 24 in the Message Bible. We said this already. He used his servant's body to carry our sins to the cross so we could get rid of sin, so we could be free to to live the right way. There's a lot of people who have been taught the right way. They understand the concept of the right way. They can show you three scriptures for each of the aspects of the theories in the right way. But I like what Pastor Tom Shaw used to say. I'd rather have a man who can live one verse of Scripture than memorize a thousand. We got to hear, we got to speak, and we got to live it. Galatians 5.13. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get back. 1 Peter 4.2 is a really cool Scripture. We already said he he used his servant body to carry our sins to the cross so we could be rid of sin, free to live that way, the right way. Verse 2 of chapter 4 says, Then you'll be able to, to live, to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by doing what you want. So often we are addicted to doing what we want. Just watch a three and a half year old not get her way or his way. Talk about tyranny. (laughs) Galatians 5.13 in the Message Bible says, It's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Free life. Just make sure that you don't use your freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do. And so destroy your freedom. Isn't that a, an editorial on America today? That we have taken off any limits of freedom and we have destroyed our freedom. Because chaos is a destruction of freedom. Just make sure that you don't use your freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your own freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another, that's how freedom grows. Free to live. Live free to pursue what God wants instead of the tyranny of our own will. We're designed by God to hear, speak, and live. God's not asking you to pursue some unattainable goals. I'll say it again. God's not asking you or I to pursue a carrot that can't be reached, a target that can't be hit, a goal that's unattainable. He's not asking you to do what's outside of your design specifications. On the contrary, He's redefining who we are and what we can do. He's redefining who we are and what we can do. Because 
we are living in a day and age where the truth has been distorted. The enemy of our soul has spent hundreds. Who's the enemy of our soul? Good. Just want to make sure you're not confused about that. The enemy of our soul is not a person. It's not a human. He's a person without a body. He's a demonic force called Satan, Lucifer, the old dragon. He hates you. He does not want anything good for you. The enemy of your soul has spent hundreds of years in this culture in order to distort God's definition of you. The enemy of your soul has spent hundreds of years in this culture seeking to redefine, to distort God's definition of you. If you don't believe me, just look at the news. What defines a man? What defines a woman? What defines marriage? What defines integrity? What defines a good employee? What defines a living wage? He has spent your whole lifetime in this culture seeking to impose upon you this wrong definition of who you are and what you can do. But we're living in a day and age where God is redefining. He's reestablishing His Word, the eternal Word. It's not a new story. It is the ancient Word of God that is true, tested by time. And He is laying again the foundation of truth. He's redefining who you are and who you are. A definition which is based on truth. It's not based on your feelings. It's not based upon our culture. It's not based upon anything but the Word of God. God's correcting the wrong definition of who you are and what you can do. He's calling us to hear, to speak. He's calling us to live. God is challenging us to rise up and live the way we've been designed to call designed to live. And guess what? We don't have to do it alone. He's provided everything we need. We've been designed and called to hear, speak, and live. The word hear means to perceive with the ear a sound made by something or somebody. That's the English translation. Of course, it also refers to the, the, the concept of listening and paying attention once your auditory nerves are responding to sound waves. Now the Hebrew and the Greek, interestingly enough, say similar things, but they dive deeper into the attention factor. Yes, it's talking about the auditory nerve, you, you're hearing sounds, but it talks specifically about to hear intelligently. To hear intelligently. To comprehend with the implication of attendance, attention and obedience to hear. You know, we, those vets around here remember the, the series of the, the names of the Lord, Jehovah El Shaddai, Jehovah uh, Tzidkenu, you know, Jehovah Shama. That's the, Greek, the Hebrew word, it's actually Shama, and it means the Lord who hears. But the Lord who hears with attention, intelligently, to see to bring to pass what you're calling for. In the Greek it says to hear, to listen, but it means to have the capacity not just of hearing but of understanding, to consider what is said. In other words, God has given us the ability to hear, but we have the choice whether we're going to understand. We have the choice whether we're going to respond and speak and live it. Hear. Speak, live. The word speak is to say something in order to, to convey information, opinion, feeling. That's the English translation. The Hebrew is debar, to speak, and it has a whole series of English words they translate it into. I won't even go into them. Answer, a point, a bid, teach, talk, tell, right? To speak. The Greek has several words. Laleo, lego, 
Yeah, that's right, the little Legos. That's the Greek word for speak, okay? But I find it interesting, both the Hebrew and the Greek, the verb tense, to speak, is laleo or lego, but the noun is logos, the Word of God. In the Hebrew, it's dabar, it's the Word of God. That which is spoken is the Word of God. We're called, we're designed to hear and to speak. God has given us that ability to speak. Even if something's wrong with your ability to make sound, we can write, we can communicate. God's given us this ability to communicate, but we get the choice. We get to choose whether we will yield our voice to the Spirit of God. You have that choice. The word live has, of course, many different meanings, but we're talking today about lifestyle, to walk. The word walk there is literally to conduct yourself, how you handle yourself, how you walk through your life. But the word lifestyle is what I want to focus on today. The, life, the word lifestyle is rarely found in any translations of the Bible. Strange. However, lifestyle is what the Bible is all about. Did you hear what I said? What's the Bible all about? What's the Bible all about? So if you're going to learn the Bible, you're being taught the Bible, what's that all about? Some of you are going to probably say, well, wait a minute, Pat. When you guys were teaching at Spirit and Truth, you said the Bible is all about relationship. That's right. Because lifestyle and the attitudes lifestyle exhibit, because, you know, it doesn't matter what you say you believe. It doesn't matter what you teach or preach. What you do exhibits your attitudes. What you do exhibits your belief structure. What you do exhibits your core values. Lifestyles and the attitudes they exhibit are what creates and sustains or tears down and destroys relationship. We have to walk the right way, live the right way. The word walk is to, like I said, to conduct my life, to regulate one's life. But it's not just talking about one foot in front of the other. That's that's not the only thing we're talking about here. When we talk about walk, we're talking about our lifestyle. Anytime you see in the scriptures someone taking, you know, walking, they're talking about their lifestyle. Example, Psalms 119, 45. I will walk in freedom. Where's freedom? Where's the geographical location of freedom? It's, it's, we're not talking about a place where you're going to walk your feet. It's a lifestyle. Where are you going to walk? I'm going to walk in freedom. For I have devoted myself to your commandments. Proverbs 2.7 says, He grants a treasure of common sense to, be, to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. That's what we do. We are to walk and to live, to conduct our lives in these right ways. In the New Testament, Jesus said in John 8, verse 12, He spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. He's not talking about how many steps you took. He's talking about your lifestyle. You don't have to live your lifestyle in darkness because Jesus, the light of life, has appeared and is offering you that life. And live, the word live literally or figuratively means to live, to exist. But it's more than just breathing and heart rate. It's about how you live your life. 1 Peter 1, two, uh, two, excuse me, 1 Peter 2, 24, we read that already, how he used his body's, ser his servant body, so he could get rid of sin, free to live the right way. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. This grace teaches us to say okay to any ungodliness because grace is involved. Anybody awake out there? 
The grace of God teaches you that it's okay to sin because you're going to be forgiven, right? Good, I'm waking you up here. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness, to say no to unrighteousness, and to say yes to be self-controlled, upright, godly lives, living now in this present day, this present age. It's the grace that teaches us that. Most people think grace teaches us that we can do whatever we want, that because that grace is around, we can sin any way we want because Jesus is going to forgive us anyway. That's not in the Bible. My Bible says the grace teaches us to say no. Our, the grace gives us that new life that gives us the power to be able to say yes to the things God wants us to do. Gives us the power to say no to our old way. Gives us the power to say no to the devil's wrong definition of who you are and what you can do. But, but I can't walk in, in blamelessness. I, I, I can't live soberly, righteously, and godly. That isn't going to happen until we get to heaven. <laughs> you see, when we say that, we're buying into the enemy's wrong definition of who you are and what you can do. Today, John, by the Holy Spirit, got up and challenged everybody not to listen to the flesh's definition of who you are, not to listen to the wrong definition of what you can do and who you are. We do need to get up and to declare it, but the vast, vastly greater importance is that when we go out those doors, when we go over to the fellowship hall, when we go to work, when we go home, that we begin to live the way the Lord defines who we are and the way the Lord defines what we can do. When these old behavior patterns start to come back to you, when you're inclined to do it, you have the choice to hear what God is saying. You have the choice to declare what God is saying. And you have the choice to say, I'm not doing that. That's what the devil says. That's what the enemy's been teaching. For 200 years he's been setting the stage. I'm not falling for that fake news. I'm going to hear what God has to say about who I am, what I'm to say, and how I can live. I don't care whether I failed yesterday. My failure yesterday doesn't redefine me. I have a new start tomorrow because His mercies are new every day. And you and you and you and me, we can walk according to the way He defined us. Tomorrow, I'm going to probably fall. Tomorrow, I'm going to make a mistake. But that, again, does not redefine who I am, I still am a son of God. I'm no longer a slave to I'm also no longer a slave to sin. That has been taken to the cross so that I can be rid of it, so that I can be free to live the way it's right. I'm not perfect. I ain't going to be perfect tomorrow. I'm not likely to be perfect after camp. But I have the choice to hear what God is saying. I have the choice to respond by speaking what God is saying. I have the choice to live the way God is saying. It's progressive. I love the way Pastor Tom Chay used to always say it. Tomorrow I'm going to sin less than today. And Tuesday, I'm going to sin less than Monday. And Wednesday, I'm going to sin less than Tuesday. I'm going to sin less, and I'm going to sin less until I am. That's the beauty of the gospel of the kingdom. What's the gospel mean? The word gospel means good news. The kingdom, that's where God has dominion. 
the good news is that we're free from the old way. And we are free to live now. Now. Today. In this kingdom where He is King. That's good news to me. So let me, let me close by saying again. The purpose for hearing is to respond. We're designed to hear, we're designed to speak, we're designed to live according to His definition of who we are and what we can do. We have to hear, but we have to speak it. We, we have to hear and speak it, but even more importantly than all of that, we have to live it. Let me say it one more time, that scripture in 1 Corinthians 1.9. God who got you started in this spiritual adventure. He shares with us the life of His Son and our Master, His Son and our Master, Jesus, because He will never give up on you. He will never give up on you. He will never give up on you. I'm not sure you guys all believe that. I believe, mo I believe that most of you think otherwise. I think it was just last week that most of us exhibited what we believe. And we thought God gave up on us. We went through this trial. We went through that trial. How could God love us and not give up on us if we went through that trial? But what does the Word of God say? I will never give up on you. When a circumstance rises to make you doubt that, what do you say? I will never give up on you. When somebody comes to you and threatens you or, or causes you to doubt, what do you say? I will never give up on you. The Lord or the devil, who are you going to believe? I will never give up 